Hello and welcome to this really special session. Uh, my name is Mishra. I'm joined by my co-host Nick Jackson. Uh, and this is In Conversations With, something that Nick and I started uh, maybe a year and a half ago, a few HashiCons ago. Uh, this kind of explores a few, few industry folks that uh, we follow, that we respect and hopefully learn from. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for today's session. So who do we have today, Nick? Well, today we, we've got somebody, I think, extra special. Somebody who, as, as you kind of said, we, we both respect, who we, we admire as, a, as an industry leader, but someone also who's created a bunch of software that we've been using pretty much all of our careers, and someone we have the pleasure of working with as well. And, and with that, I'd, I'd like to, to welcome Mitchell, uh, Mitchell Hashimoto, co-founder of HashiCorp. Welcome to In Conversation With Him, and thank you so much for agreeing to talk with us today, Mitchell. Hello to you both. Yeah, this is going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. Now. First question. So we, we always ask this question to people and we, we try to kind of like develop a, a pathway throughout your career and kind of starting with first exposure. What was the first sort of exposure that you had to programming? What were your kind of your first earliest memories of it? Um, it was messy because I was just trying to figure out how software was made. I was like double clicking things on a Windows PC and it just hit me, you know, I was 12 years old, and it hit me that, like, someone had to have made this somehow. But I had no idea. I didn't know the word programming. I didn't know code. You know, I didn't know any concepts. I was just, like, trying to search around, you know, just pre-Google, too, just web search around, like, how is this thing made? And I started seeing, like, snippets of code, but, I, you know, I had no idea what I was looking at or anything. But that was sort of my first foray into, yeah, how, how these things work. No, I know that you, you went to University of Washington, and I, I wonder if some of your early experiences there shaped your you know, destination, which was somewhere in computer science and software. Yeah, I, so I had decided, I came into the University of Washington already knowing that I wanted to major in computer science. I'd already taught myself to code at that point. I think the things that uh, you know, university changed for me was uh, really thinking, I guess, thinking about computers uh, more systematically less like uh, it's hard to describe but I mean less like you know just have a hammer and hammering nails and making something and more design and like the effects of things and, and that sort of aspect of it uh, but I think the most important thing that happened at university was the people I met such as Armon right I mean I think that was probably the the biggest aspect of the universe of university life that I can't uh, overstate and, and university was also when you first created Vagrant I, I believe Yep. What, what was it that kind of drove you to do that? Was it something that was like scratching a personal itch to, to solve one of your own problems? Or was it something you were thinking, you know what, I could make a business out of my, my software? Yeah, yeah, no, no business, definitely not. Uh, you know, people can't believe this, but I, I just want to make it extra clear because it's, it's very true. And, and, and the reality is that I never, ever, ever planned or thought about building a business around the tools I was creating. It was not a goal. It wasn't even a thought of maybe one day I'll do this if it's successful, like zero. You know, my thinking was if it's successful, cool. Like, you know, it was a very young way of thinking of like, I wasn't thinking very far ahead. Um, but yeah, I, I created Vagrant in college. It was scratching my own itch. I was trying to, I liked working on a lot of different projects at any given time. And there was really no good way for me to work on all these different projects without dependencies uh, just stumbling all over each other, just database versions and web server configurations and things like that. And, you know, I was changing programming languages. And so uh, for me as a, at the time, very, you know, almost broke college student, like cloud computing existed barely as like a, you know, infant, but I, I would, it didn't matter because I couldn't pay for it anyway. I really needed something that would run on my own machine and that really, those constraints really gave way to what Vagrant became. So was, I guess, was Vagrant your first foray into open source or whether you've like dipped your feet earlier than this? Yeah, no, no, it was uh, the first successful foray or eventually successful foray, but uh, no, I had dozens of projects that no one's ever heard about that 
never found. You know, some still exist on GitHub. Some are just deleted. They don't matter. But I had been consuming open source since I was probably like 12, 13. That's how, you know, as a 12, 13 year old that can't spend money on books or anything, that's how I learned, like finding source code online. There, I couldn't take classes. I couldn't buy books. I couldn't buy, you know, online videos, nothing, none of that. And so I was just used to open source. And then a lot of what I did, I ended up sharing the source code. You know, this is pre-GitHub, so I would just like zip it or targz it and upload it somewhere. Um, I was very familiar with that, but I, I never had anything that really was used by people in any big way until Vagrant. And did, was the OSS stuff immediately popular, or, or was it something that, that sort of developed over, over the course of your time working yeah, not, on it at college? Not at all immediately popular. Um, it had an initial bump because it got onto Hacker News uh, and got some initial feedback and stuff like that. The feedback was mostly bad, <laughs> as you would expect Hacker News to, to be. And also, it was, it, uh, the early versions of Vagrant were not that good. Um, but I kind of kept plugging away at it, and you know, it, it didn't grow at all. It took probably about a year for any sort of baby growth to even start coming in, like nothing compared to what it is today. Um, I, I kind of cared, right? Like it felt bad that, that it wasn't seeing a lot of growth, but at the same time, there was a big part of me that also didn't care because I was still solving my own problem and I didn't super care if other people used it. Uh, I was mostly offended <laughs> in some ways because I thought it was useful and I couldn't understand why other people didn't think it was useful. Yeah, I think that that's, that experience of like, you know, building an open source project and then putting it out in the community is is fairly tedious. I feel yes. like you have to do a lot to, to make it successful. And I think when I say a lot, a lot of, I feel advocacy work needs to be done in order for people to kind of explore some of that stuff. Did you get into that? Did you like go to conferences and so on? Yeah, I mean, I think this was a, one of the first hard lessons I probably learned uh, when I did open sources. I always uh, had this purist sort of idea um, in my younger age of like, you build something good and by merit it will succeed, or people will hear about it or something. And it's like, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Merit has almost nothing to do with it. Like, you build something and it could be bad and it could still super succeed. It really depends on how many people know about it, whether you're solving people's problems well enough, um, and, and that sort of thing. So, you know, Vagrant wasn't growing at all, um, but how could people find it? How, like, how do I explain what Vagrant is? Like, you can't assume people are going to take the time to really understand your product. You really have to nail that like elevator pitch sort of thing. So I started going again, you know, broke college student. I just started going to local meetups that I could, you know, take the bus to or, or uh, rent a bike or something or take my own bike and, and go there. Um, and that's sort of how it got started. And it was really this slow growth strategy uh, to do it. And, and I absolutely had to do that. That's how people found out about the project. Just quickly switching back to, you know, I'm, I'm curious, so quickly switching back to like your university experience, you feel like formally learning about computer science and learning about all the concepts, did that ever inform some of like the, the things that you did in open source? Or do you feel it's irrelevant like to go to a university and then also be successful in let's say open source software? Yeah, so, you know, I think of course that you could be successful without going to university. However, I think that you know, I'm, I think that university computer science is extremely important as well. So I think they're just two different uh, sort of uh, ways of learning and, you know, it equips you better for certain situations. Can you learn those yourself? Absolutely. But, you know, the nice thing about school is it forces you to learn these concepts, things that you might find boring, things that you might not see why it's relevant, and then it all kind of connects later. So for me, you know, and what, what I've done and what we've done at HashiCorp, like I use my computer science education on a weekly, daily basis, like literally, you know, graph theory, compilers, theory of computation, discrete mathematics, like all of these things come up every single day. Like I don't, I don't know how I would be able to do what I did. I don't think I would have had the patience to teach myself these concepts because I, I've, I feel that people who self-teach tend to teach themselves very concrete how to solve a problem but the abstract thinking is more boring, and I, I wouldn't be able to self-teach that myself because I'd be too bored, but it really alters the way you think in a way that I think is important. So after leaving sort of college, after leaving university, there was a little while before HashiCorp really got going. What were you up to in that time? 
I had a job offer for some companies up in Seattle because I went to University of Washington, and uh, I had no job offers and didn't interview with anybody down in San Francisco. But I, at the last minute, like I was about to sign a job offer up in Seattle, at the last minute, I decided, no, I'm just going to move to San Francisco without a job because, you know, I didn't really know as this, as this recent college grad. I didn't really know, but I just, I just felt that there was a lot of energy around tech in San Francisco. I didn't understand it. Um, I knew that, you know, on the business side, I knew people were like getting rich in San Francisco and I didn't understand that. And I really wanted to under, like learn what was going on down there. And I figured, you know, I don't have a family. I don't have any debt right now. Well, it's a little bit of student debt, but I have, you know, that's all I have. I don't have a car payment, house payment, things like that. So this is the best time for me to go and let's just see what's happening. Um, and so I just moved to San Francisco and in the process started uh, emailing people to look for a job. And so prior to HashiCorp, I found a job down here with a startup and just sort of absorbed uh, the environment. So what would, I guess, what were the things that happened, I guess, at that job that led you to, you know, finally found HashiCorp eventually? Yeah, there, that's, um, there's actually a few things. I mean, I think the, the company ultimately didn't succeed, but there was so, it was so important to my career because I was able to join as like the I was almost like the second engineer, at, you know, I was maybe employee number, I don't know, four or five at this, at this startup. So I got to really be present. I get to watch the founder talk to investors. I got to meet the investors. They didn't care about me, but like I got to meet them. Um, I got to see how all that worked. Um, and I think, so I think on, on the non-technical side, I really got to a front row seat to Silicon Valley culture and startup and, you know, fundraising and those sorts of growth challenges. And then on the technical side, being an early engineer, even though I was junior, I basically had free reign to do what I wanted. And I was able to use this as a playground for a lot of my ideas that I guess at the time were a little bit weirder. Um, you know, like my obsession almost with like automating things end to end. Um, I really got to push that all the way to the limit. And while we didn't build any of the HashiCorp software there, uh, we, we built worse versions of the ideas that ultimately became a lot of things like Terraform and Console and so on. And so, I don't know, I think, you know, it was nice to get, we solved real problems, like me and Arm Armand eventually joined me there. We solved real problems, but we were able to do it in an R&D style way uh, that I think, you know, if we joined a bigger company, we would have been told, you know, what box to fit in, that, and we didn't have to worry about that. So, so eventually you do give up the day job, you decide, let's go, found our own company, let's start HashiCorp. That's a brave thing to do. I mean, there's, there's many people who, who wouldn't have had the confidence to do that. There's the uncertainty, will it succeed? How am I gonna make money? What were all of the things going through your mind as you, you made that transition? Yeah, yeah, and I, it's funny because I think people who don't know me don't realize that I'm a very uh, uh, like risk averse person. Uh, I'm very careful, I'm very like, financially careful, like all those sorts of things. So starting a company, I never thought I would do it and I definitely didn't want to do it. Um, and I think the things that were happening, there was multiple things happening at the time that pushed me to do it. One was I really loved working on these open source projects like Vagrant and, and I was starting Packer at the time and I wanted to find a way to work on them. I couldn't justify time at work to work on them. So I was working on them at night um, you know, up until like one or two in the morning and then I was getting on a bus to get back to work at like 8 a.m. and I just mentally like I knew it was unhealthy. I wasn't in a very good place and I knew that I had to pick one or the other. Um, I think the other side was, believe it or not, my boss at that company uh, saw me working on these projects and he was encouraging me to quit. He was telling me, these are cool, you have to go do this like full time. Like this is, there's something here, I don't know what it is, but there's something here, you should go. And so he was pushing me on like, a, it was weird to come to work and being encouraged to quit, but also being like, I don't want you to quit because you're doing a good job. It was a kind of a weird thing, but it was, he was pushing me. And then I think the one thing that it wouldn't have happened uh, without these people is really like my parents is, uh, I ended up calling them and telling them what's going on. And, and I'm pretty close to my parents, but we don't talk about stuff like this that often. And, and I was just telling them how I really wanted to work on this thing uh, and I wanted to quit, but I have such a stable job and it has health care. And, you know, the things that, like, you know, my family background, that's all they want, right? They're like, just get a stable job. Do not take risks, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, what, what really surprised me is, like, without hesitation, 
my dad, who's the more careful parent that I have, uh, was like, you need to go do this. You need to quit your job. And I, and, I, and I think that really pushed me to just give it a shot. That's that's super interesting. So you feel like, I guess, as the company grew, as the as HashiCorp probably started with you and Arman, you hired a, new, a few few different folks. You go to like 10 people, then 50 people, let's say 100 people. Has your, like, how is your role like kind of evolving with the company? I know like, you know, you're the primary, you know, contributor to a bunch of these projects that HashiCorp created. Uh, you know, do you, do you feel you ended up consume, consume, being consumed by things that were non-coding? Uh, essentially, you have an engineering background, but now you have to do all of these other things that you have to learn about as well. Yeah, yeah. I think what I tell new founders now is, you know, I thought that I was starting HashiCorp to be able to work on my passion and my, what I love. Um, and realistically, uh, I started HashiCorp. And when you start a company, you start a company to enable others to work on what you love. Um, as a founder, I learned really quickly that my job was going to be whatever the company needed. Um, and, you know, I filled in engineering pretty quickly with employees. And so the company didn't need that anymore. It really needed more help on investor relations and fundraising and uh, marketing and early sales and that, you know, partnerships, that sort of thing. And so really quickly, I would say uh, the engineering went by the wayside and I was consumed by everything else uh, and it changed you know you compress like nine years of history into like 10 seconds there but it it changed relatively frequently but um, I mean I think the one thing I learned throughout that process is that I love engineering but at the same time you know I there's there's a there's a Japanese like figure of speech called gaman which basically means like um, you put up with it in a way like it, it's you know if something is kind of like a bad situation or hard or difficult like, you know, my parents and my grandparents, whatever, so they just come on, like, just, you know, you know, focus in on it and just do it, you know, be quiet and do your job. And, you know, I think that for a long time, that's what I was practicing, uh, because this is what the company needed, and I want the company to succeed. It, succeed. So uh, that's sort of uh, how I looked at it. But the engineering must have just been burning away. I mean, you know, Misha and I've worked with you for, for four years or so nearly, and we would all often see the, the, still, he would come in with like great open source projects and cools and be like away on vacation or something and just like hacking away on the code because it was something that you loved. And uh, that, that, that for us, I think, is super cool to see as well, just the fact that you're following that passion. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it always, I always found time for engineering. And I think you always, that's like, that's a sign of what you're passionate about or something is like, I, I would have eight hour days where I couldn't code and I would still make another few hours where I would just code. And even if it wasn't HashiCorp related, I would just do it. And I would, you know, at the, it, maybe it wasn't the best idea for like work-life balance, but it wasn't something that was draining me. It was something that was energizing me and what I wanted to do. And so I think showing that consistently, like I think over the nine year history of HashiCorp, um, we could probably verify this on GitHub or something, but I don't think I ever went more than seven days without making a commit somewhere, you know, not necessarily in HashiCorp. Um, and then early on, of course, in HashiCorp, like there was a, uh, I knew that, I know this for sure, I don't know the exact number of years, but it was like 2010 to 2015 or 16. Uh, there wasn't a single day I didn't commit. 365 days a year for five years straight, I had at least one commit. And people say, oh, that's unhealthy or something. And probably is, but like, again, like I wasn't doing it because someone was forcing me. I did, I, it's what I wanted to do. It's what I'm passionate about. It's what, where I derive joy. And so I think, you know, I always made time for it. And, and yeah, it's what I love. And it's, I mean, sort of without mentioning any particular projects, but it's surprising where your code crops up. I mean, you look, you look through some stuff in GoMod when you're looking through dependencies and there'll be a package by Mitchell or Armand somewhere buried deep down in there. Uh, because obviously you were you know, prolific at, at kind of contributing to, to Go specifically as a language in open source. but And also that early on, I think, I feel like the early Go ecosystem, Go didn't have a lot of libraries that languages have on the day they launch. And I, I feel like, you know, probably end up creating some of these libraries. I know you've shared with me, end up writing like re-implementing DCP at some point yeah. with, with Go or something. Yeah, yeah. Super interesting. Talking about code and talking about contributions, Recently, you made an announcement. I wouldn't call it a big announcement, but it was a substantial announcement, at least for us at HashiCorp, uh, that you're transitioning into an individual contributor role in the company. 
means you've been doing means for people that know you and you know I worked with you previously you've been doing that for a while now it was it was not that big of a surprise uh, but you've officially transitioned into an individual contributor so what were some of the motivations of like you you kind of transitioning in and how do you feel now that you're an IC at, at HashiCorp yeah yeah i mean i think the, moti- the the biggest you know core nugget motivation was what we just talked about which was that engineering was obviously my passion um, and then a lot of stuff sort of builds on on that core, which is that I think for the company, the place where I've always had the biggest impact uh, is is probably both like culturally, of course, but that doesn't really change no matter where you are, uh, but also the engineering. And so, I, I, you know, I think it's good for the company. Um, it's selfishly what I wanted. Um, and it's always been sort of a goal. I think it is important for the company. I've always had this philosophy since the beginning. Early employees know I've, I've said this out loud many times, which is that I want to build a company that doesn't need me. Um, and so, like, I, Armand and I used to formalize this. We don't do this anymore, but we used to for a number of years had, like, monthly, then it turned to quarterly sort of meetings with each other where we would just spend an hour talking about what parts of the corporate process are we involved in and how... And are we like singularly involved or if we were on like vacation, could someone else do it? Like we wanted to make sure every part of the business had was never blocked by us, basically. And and that's how we sort of determined who to hire, who to sort of give more autonomy to, when to change certain processes. Uh, and so that that's always been philosophically important to me as well. So, yeah, I think those three things together. And, and like you said, it wasn't, you know, the announcement was a really big like commitment point, I guess, to saying it's happening, but practically speaking, the transition's been happening for a couple of years. So for me on a day-to-day basis, it hasn't been a huge change, except that it's been a relief that I could talk about it with people. With regard to the kind of the software development process, I mean, we've openly talked about how HashiCorp does things through RFCs, how there's this sort of asynchronous open discussion around a lot of the features and things like that. But is there any ever kind of any incidents where as, as the creator of, of a lot of the software, you, you kind of see the direction maybe getting pulled one way, which is not 100% to kind of what you would do yourself. And, and how would you deal with that uh, in, in that sort of instance if it occurs? Totally. I mean, uh, uh, fairly frequently, I would say I, I see things like that. And, uh, you know, when I was CTO, I would probably get involved really directly and try to try to I don't know, write the direction is not the right way to do it because both directions might be right, but write it to what I wanted, I guess. Um, This has been a big change for me as an IC is I'm more of an advisor now. So I still send emails, you know, to engineering leadership and Armand, who's my boss, uh, Armand, regularly of here's what I think. This is basically my opinion. You know, take it, leave it, whatever. But I've sort of let go on various uh, things because... Again, you, you kind of have to. The company has to grow on its own and form its own personality. And you know, I'll be honest. Since since stepping down, it's only been like two months. And since, since stepping down, there have been a couple of things I've looked at where I've thought I would never, I would never have done it this way, or or I I don't think I would have let it reach this point where it happened this way. But they're making their own decisions, and that's better for me personally, and that's better for the company. So um, it's a good thing. That's super interesting because, like, I think. Looking at your career now, Mitchell, like you, you started off like as a, I guess, a new grad, worked on computer science stuff as an IC, founded the company, became a co-founder, became a CTO, and then now stepped on you back to where you are, I yeah. guess, to, to square one. So my second last question to you is you, you have had like amazing, probably amazing experiences. Some of them have been probably hard uh, because you're you know, creating a company. It's very difficult to create a company, especially to sustain it for that long. And also, I'm sure there's experiences that are great uh, in doing so, and you probably learned a lot. So what would be one piece of advice, maybe multiple pieces of advice, is for folks that are like joining the world of technology and, and, and want to like pursue it uh, and maybe pursue it in the way that you did? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a couple. One that I hit on already, so we don't need to dwell on it, is, is realizing that technology doesn't succeed on merit. And so you know, really understanding that marketing is a really important aspect, but not just marketing, but, you know, partnerships and other aspects of the product. Like the product as a whole uh, is important. It can't just be technologically great and 
for an engineer coming out of college. I think that's really important to understand because I do feel like universities focus on, uh, I don't know, theoretical beauty in a sense, and it's it's the real world's a lot messier. Um, and then I think the other feedback, you know, I would give myself that I had to learn over time, uh, and something my boss uh, at the previous my previous job would always tell me that I need to improve on was being directly part of the value generation of a company or a business or whatever. So, you know, I came in and just looked at it as like, what technical problems exist? I'm going to solve them. But step stepping back and being like, is it important to solve this problem for the company? You know, like connecting the actual end to end, like, does it improve our customers? It's not just because like, it's strictly better, but does it actually like drive more value for the business? And I think having been a manager now, now I'm no longer one, but having been one in the past, I just witnessed firsthand as a manager, like how much that helped me when people behaved that way, but also how people tend to be, that's how careers actually grow is value driven. So, you know, I think I always correct like family members when they'll say like, they'll tell my younger cousins or they'll tell, you know, my siblings or something be like, Oh, work hard. I'm like, hard work is important, but like, you know, everybody works pretty hard and yet there's still people that are much more successful than others. It's like, it's not just working hard. You have to pair it with like, you know, working valuably. You have to be a valuable, irreplaceable sort of component in the system to continue to grow. And so I try to encourage, uh, I still do like donuts and one-on-ones when I tend to get newer Hashgrabber employees. And I'm always like, find a way that you can, you know, separate from the pack and create value for the company and not just not just do your job, right? And I think that's a way to really grow quickly. That was, yeah, that, that, that's a great piece of advice. And I feel like, you know, that drives, a, I've seen that happen firsthand where folks folks have associated with things that are, are more value and they might not be the most, I guess, flashy or uh, the, the things that might, you know, create headlines in the company, uh, but might be really valuable in the long term. And, you know, they've seen, you know, the good ma- the management has rewarded those people and, and those careers have been have been succeeding. So that that's a great piece of advice. Uh, that was my second last question. Nick, do you have a, a last question for us? I have one question, final question. <laughs> and and this is all about like what the future holds for Mitchell. Because sure. there's a bunch of people who I'm 100% positive are like, yeah, Mitchell will be drinking, I don't know, <laughs> like cocktails on a beach, living a life in, in the sunshine. Sounds uh, good. I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced. I'm no. like we we know that it's not going to be true. Like, no. what what's next? What, uh, what's, I mean, what is the future going to hold? Yeah, I mean, I think that what's amazing is uh, even you know, so even since the announcement, which was in July, I think, and July is when I formally stepped off the board and stepped off the E team. So, it, even though I mentioned earlier there wasn't a big change, the one big change was I immediately dropped like board meetings. I immediately dropped um, like five or six hours of one-on-ones a week that I used to have with other executives. I got a lot of time overnight back. And what's really interesting, and I was just telling my wife about this, is it's on a week-by-week basis, I could like actually feel this creative energy and like excitement and stuff like forming. Like my, my again, like my brain is like changing and it's almost like I feel like I'm sending messages every single day to other friends being like, you need to do this idea here. I sent you a whole doc of what I would do. And like, there's so many ideas like blowing up right now. And I think it's just like the freedom to think has given, I, almost, I, I say it's given me back my creative energy that I think was stifled a little bit before. Uh, and a lot of that's also coming out in HashiCorp direct things. I'm working directly on products. I have some other stuff I want to work on. Um, so I think, you know, the future for me, uh, is uh, is probably sometimes drinking cocktails on the beach, but nor on a, at a normal pace. Uh, but I think for the rest rest of it, it's really you know trying to drive that creative energy towards helping the company and uh, yeah, continuing to create. I don't think I don't think I could stop it yet. So I'll I'll keep creating. Well, I mean, I, th- I think I can speak for, for Misha, I'm sure, and probably for many others who work with the company. We, we feel very blessed to, to have worked with you and to have learned from you. Uh, we absolutely want to say thank you so much for, for agreeing to, to be on in conversation with. And we're, we're going to like, well, I don't know about you, Misha, but I've got a little, 
a little bit of money that I'm, I'm kind of going to be tucked away, ready to find out what these little secret investments are going to be. I don't know about you. you? True. True. Yeah, we'll all invest in Mitchell's <laughs> ideas. That's the way to go. <laughs> but Mitchell, honestly, thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Thank you both. Thank you.